Dacia advised timing belts are changed every 72,000 miles or 6 years. Replacing the timing belt is very important, as a failed belt often results in the valves and pistons colliding, resulting in expensive engine damage. Here is an overview of the engine before I start work. This job requires the following tooling. 6, 7, 8, 10, 13, 16, 17 and 18 mm sockets, a Torx 20 driver, hose clip pliers, a flat screwdriver, a trim lever tool, a 7 mm flywheel locking pin, a 6 mm allen key, torque wrenches and an angular torque gauge. Now to raise the vehicle, I use two hydraulic jacks, one on each seal. If using two jacks like I am here, it makes sense to jack up each side a little bit at a time so the car's not too leaned over. Never go under a car without making safe with axle stands rated to handle the load. I tend to leave the jacks in place as well, so in effect I have four items protecting me. Using a 10mm socket, undo the eight bolts securing the under tray. Here's the under tray and I've coloured the bolt yellow and this needs removing first. And here's the tray removed. We will need to drain the cooling system as the water pump is to be removed from the engine block. You will need a Torx 20 driver for the plastic flap and some hose clip pliers. We're going to remove the coolant cap. This will prevent a vacuum from forming when we release the lower radiator hose, as shown there. That clip is very awkward to get to, and you'll need to get there from the flap on the left-hand side, as shown here. Remove the two screws, and then pull the flap downwards. You'll then be able to see the hose clip and it is sort of buried in there a bit. There we go. It's pretty much buried. Um, should have some fun getting that out. I did. Then it's just a case of pull the hose and watch your garage get flooded. Because Dacia advised using compressed air to blow out the remaining water, that's what I did. Though it's probably not strictly necessary. This is the clamp tool I used. Probably made life a little bit easier. I poured the old antifreeze into a jug just because I wanted to use a hydrometer to see how much protection 
the old antifreeze offered. And it did raise two discs, which meant it was still protected down to minus 15 degrees. Now don't forget to replace the lower radiator hose and the clamp in readiness for the fresh coolant after the water pump has been replaced. Now to remove the road wheel and the plastic wheel arch liner. Tools needed. A 17mm socket and breaker bar for the wheel, a flat bladed screwdriver and Torx 20 driver and a trim tool to lever the plastic clips. So a good yank on that plastic trim and then just to remove the four 17mm nuts. Then just pull the wheel off and pop that to one side. You'll need it later. So this piece unscrews. This piece pulls off, but it's also held in at the bottom with one of those plastic grommet clip things. The interior trim tool is quite useful for just popping in there and pulling that down. So this panel reveals the side of the engine where the crankshaft is and you can also see the alternator there. Then we need to remove this flap here using a Torx 20 screwdriver and another one of those push fit grommet fasteners. Next is the wheel arch liner. There's quite a few fasteners dotted all around underneath. This is the Torx 20 again. This is another plastic push fit fastener. Again, a trim tool pulls those out okay. There's two like plastic screwdriver ones down here, which screw out quite easily. Another one that requires a screwdriver. There was two fasteners here and I struggled with those for some reason and I did break the top on them. Now it's just a case of easing the plastic liner out without damaging anything. It does require some force in this area. And there we go, it's basically out. Just ease it out from under the wheel arch.
and out it comes. There you can see the charcoal canister of the EVAP system to prevent petrol fumes getting out into the atmosphere. And looking at the front of the engine, we can see the flywheel there, the starter motor and the coolant pump tube. Before I forget, we should disconnect the battery for safety. Because I didn't know the code for the radio, I took the added precaution of using a memory saver as shown here. This feeds some power to the ECU via the OBD socket in the car. So firstly what we do with this is we connect it to the OBD socket on the car. As you can see it's not safe to disconnect the main battery yet, but on supplying external power, there's our positive, and our negative, and now the device says it's safe to proceed and disconnect the main car battery knowing that the ECU has still got some power to hold all its memory settings and for the radio code. So using a 10 millimeter socket we can now disconnect the negative on the battery. To remove the engine cover you'll need the following a 7mm socket for the Jubilee clip or a flat bladed screwdriver. So the air intake hose is like a plastic push fit so you will need to carefully prise that back out. There we go. Then remove this tube using a 7mm socket or a flat bladed screwdriver. Remove the Jubilee clip on the throttle body. The cover is held on with three plastic poppers that push into rubber mounts. There's also a tube on the side which is connected to the gearbox, probably like a breather pipe. So just pop that to one side and then that should just pull up and away. And there's the three plastic push fit connectors. I normally put a little bit of grease back on those so the next time it's easier to pull it off. We now need to loosen the crankshaft bolt. To do this we must lock the flywheel and engine block together. The locking pin I used was 6.74mm and we also needed an 18mm socket with a hefty ratchet to rotate the engine. Always rotate the engine in the normal direction. Alright now going underneath the car. This is the flywheel and the hole in the flywheel is exactly the size of this pin which using a vernier is 7.89 millimeters. This is only for size guide. So this is the actual locking pin I used, which is like a bent metal bar that fits through there and it hits the flywheel. So we've got to turn the flywheel to that hole lines up with that pin and then the two are coincide and we can lock the flywheel. Here's a close-up of the pin in the hole which is on the engine block. Now 
just for the purpose of information the pin here that I was using was 6.74 millimeters so now if we turn the engine via the crankshaft um, in a clockwise direction slowly we should be able to put some pressure on this pin and you can sort of hear it scraping as it's going along the flywheel and then obviously it goes silent when there's the, the hole comes up and then we know that we can then push it in and then the flywheel's locked and then in it goes now we can use an 18 millimeter socket to remove that crankshaft nut without the engine turning over because it's now locked Sometimes bigger is better. I always seem to need to be where that camera is. And then off comes the crankshafts pulley, along with the two stretch belts. Those belts should be replaced with new ones, technically. And here you can see the lower part of the timing belt around the crankshaft pulley. Coloured in here. To gain access to the timing belt, we have to remove the cover. On this engine, the cover is part of the right hand engine mount, so we must support the engine while we remove that engine mount. The engine must remain supported until the job has been completed. I'm going to use a long reach bottle jack for this. With the engine supported from underneath, we are then safe to remove that engine mounting without the engine dropping and damaging the other mounts or the engine itself. The engine mount is held with five bolts. You will need a 16 mm socket for these. Now to remove those five bolts with the 16 mm socket. Just loosening them all first. Once these two are off, the engine will actually move backwards and forwards, as you can see. Won't drop down though, so it's actually overhanging the body. But there we go. Definitely free. Once these three are undone, the engine will be completely free to drop down. So it's only the bottle jack that's holding it up. And so the mount is now totally free and we can withdraw that. And thankfully the engine didn't drop. Now remove the cast aluminium upper timing cover. This is held on with four bolts and requires a 10 mm socket.
So that's the first bolt out. Then the second bolt, just checking its length is the same as the first bolt, which it is. Now bolt number three and confirming it's the same length as the other two and it is. Bolt number four is a bit harder to get to so I'm going to use one of these adapters so it's more low profile. and just check again whether it's the same length as the others and yes so all four bolts are the same length and then off comes the cast aluminium top part of the timing belt stroke engine mount and there's the belt holes so one two, three, and four. So with the top part of the timing cover removed, we can clearly see the timing belt and the tensioner. The belt actually doesn't look too bad. Certainly no obvious signs of cracking. Then to remove the intermediate cover, this is held on with two bolts and requires an 8mm socket. I found it was easier to access these two bolts from underneath. And then onto the other bolt next to the power steering pump. This one was a little bit trickier. And off it comes. There we go. You can now see the water pump pulley just there below my hand. There it is. It looks a little bit rusty on the surface. There you can see the water pump pulley. And this is the intermediate cover removed. Here you can see the path of the timing belt very clearly and the pulleys. For future reference, note this water pump tube because we will be removing this later on. Lastly, to remove the lower cover, this is held on with just one bolt and again requires an 8mm socket.
and then lift away the lower timing cover as so. Please note the timing indentations. From this angle you can clearly see the three markings 1, 2 and 3. I'll mark those with white pen to highlight them. Even yellow pen. I mark them with yellow pen actually, not white. Then we refit the crankshaft accessory pulley bolt and its retaining washer. Like so. This enables us to rotate the engine from the crankshaft so that we can align all the timing marks. OK, so we're now aligned correctly at the crankshaft end, but we now need to check the camshaft at the top. Ah, but looking at the camshaft, the marking is at the 6 o'clock position and it needs to be at the 12 o'clock, so we're 180 degrees out. We're going to need to rotate the crank and bring that mark up to the 12 o'clock position. So I'm going to remark it all in yellow to make it clearer so you can see as I turn the crank you can watch the marks align. There you are, with the yellow marks you can clearly see that it's 180 degrees out. So if we rotate the crank 360 degrees, that should bring this up to the 12 o'clock position, being that there's 21 teeth on the crank and 42 teeth on the camshaft. So the crank should now still be in alignment after one revolution. So there we go, as we can see, clearly marked and lined up at the 12 o'clock. So now back to the flywheel and the locking pin. They should be aligned if all is correct. And yes, it slides in nicely. Now that everything is aligned up and the lower part of the engine is mechanically locked, we can remove the tensioner and the timing belt. For this you will need a 13mm socket and maybe a 6mm Allen key. The tensioner is removed for the 13mm socket. What I tend to do as an added precaution before removing the timing belt is I also add some extra markings on it at the top and the bottom so I know where the alignment was with the crankshaft and the camshaft. I then copy those marks onto the new belt. It's sort of like a backup so that I know that the belt's definitely gone on in the correct place as was the old belt. Now use the 6mm Allen key and turn in a clockwise direction to loosen the tensioner and then you can remove it along with the timing belt. Here's a close up view of me removing the tensioner. Please note the two prongs that straddle the ridge in the middle. I'll put it back on again. See the two prongs? They have to go each side of that ridge there. There it goes. So here is the old belt removed now. And looking at it, there is some faint, very fine hairline cracks on there. Um, but nothing too obvious. can still read the details on the original belt. As it's often advised that the water pump be replaced, especially as the car has done around 100,000 miles, we now need to tackle this part. There is a pipe from the water pump that snakes behind the power steering pump. 
This isn't a problem though, as it's a push fit pipe with just one bolt holding it. 8mm socket required. Here you can see the single bolt holding that push fit pipe in place. And here's the bolt again, pointing at it with my finger, just to the left of the dipstick. So if we use an 8mm socket, we can then remove that single bolt. Basically, the pipe is pushed in with a rubber O-ring. Now that will have hardened over time, so it will be quite stiff to come out. So it will take quite a bit of wiggling, but if you keep at it, it will come out eventually. Um, but it does take a while. And here's basically the pipe. I have actually pre-greased this to make it easier to pull it back out. And there you can see it's just a push-fit connector almost like what you'd get on plumbing. And here's a closer look at the pipe. As you can see, just held in with one bolt. Now that the water pump pipe has been removed, we can remove the water pump itself. This requires removing seven bolts using an eight millimeter socket. So the water pump is held in with seven bolts and the black plastic part on the right hand side of this picture, where I am now, that piece stays in place. It comes away with the pump and we undo that later on when the pump's actually away from the engine. So it's just a case of working your way through the seven bolts and once all seven are out giving the water pump a little bit of a persuasion with a hammer maybe um, or a lever Yes, yeah, so I was quite worried about that plastic um, push fit pipe that goes behind the power steering pump because I did think I might have to move the power steering pump away. Um, luckily I realised that it was probably a push fit pipe, um, which it was thankfully, because there's no way you would get to those two bolts where that piece of pipe screws onto the water pump. As I pull it away now, you should be able to see the two bolts, you can see one there now, and there's the second one at the top of that. And as you can see, it's clearly a push fit. And out she comes. Ready for a new pump. And we will have to clean the surface of the engine block there before we refit the new pump and gasket. So if we look at the old pump, we can clearly see the black push fit joint and the original pipe that we took out, how easy it just pushes in. Obviously I've put some red rubber grease on that o-ring. And the orange gasket. Now we need to very carefully remove any of the old gasket material still present, making sure that we don't actually damage the surface at all. Please see part two for the completion of this video.